Hello, everyone. I'm going to start where uh, Mahesh left. Um, he kind of uh, hinted at global uncertainty. Uh, my focus is going to be more in terms of near, near termness uh, in the way our macro is evolving. Uh, so while we kind of are fairly uh, constructive, you know, you heard uh, speakers since morning as to the prospects for the Indian economy is uh, pretty bright over the next couple of years. Uh, at this point in time, of course, India, as well as, you know, the uh, rest of the world is experiencing a cyclical slow slowdown. Um, uh, pretty much all indicators that uh, we track um, are actually hinting at a mild slowdown um, in our economy. Uh, growth rate has uh, fallen to, uh, the run rate has fallen to about 6.5%. Uh, industrial uh, growth over the last three, four months has been steadily coming off and uh, is at near zero rate now. Um, auto sales uh, numbers have uh, nosedived. Uh, last five, six months have been pretty bad for commercial vehicles, um, uh, two wheelers, uh, PV sales, car sales, you know, everything, you know, you kind of seen uh, cyclical slowdown you know, coming in. Uh, many of these uh, sectors are imports, um, which are also fairly close proxy of you know how our economy is doing. Is also has has fallen quite a lot over the last couple of months. So so the big picture, of course, is that uh, that you know the general economy has uh, kind of slowed uh, pretty significantly over the last five six months. But within economy, about 60 61 percent of our economy is. Uh, is consumption, so we are fairly uh, consumer-oriented economy, and that part of our our, our economy is actually slowed uh, quite substantially. So that part, uh, which is about uh, near 60, 61 percent, has has kind of sequentially slowed in last two, two, three quarters. Um, you know, so consumer durables, non-durables, uh, air traffic, and you know many other sectors that kind of are close proxies of. Uh, uh, consumer economy are beginning to hint that you know, we are having a reasonable uh, set of slowdown. This is on the back of, of course, a fairly strong consumption growth that India has had for the last couple of years. Um, you know, I talked about automobile sales. You know, the car sales are also good proxies of uh, you know, how uh, general consumption is doing, and you know, all of that is actually hinting at a kind of slowdown. Now, you know, there are a couple of reasons. Um, it, it, it's not fairly certain, though, because, um, you know, uh, as to why a consumption, which has, which has gone quite well for the last couple of years, why is it slowing? So these are our speculations. You know, these are, these are the things that we think maybe that, uh, that pay commission, which was rolled out in the middle of uh, FY17, uh, that's beginning to fade. Now, pay commission, of course, as you know, um, is is uh, the pop that uh, public servants, you know, people working for uh, various governments, local bodies, uh, state governments, and central governments, every 10 year they receive a salary hike. You know, this time around it was about 23%. Uh, in number terms, it was about a 1 lakh crore worth of pop in terms of increase in salary. And in, in let's say, GDP, it was almost about a 50 basis point pop. Um, you know, so that's the kind of salary increase the public servants experience, and, you know, and which what kind of uh, played out over the last couple of years in terms of uh, higher consumption. When a typical middle class um, public servant experiences this 20-25% uh, salary hike, what you've done, what we've seen in India across you know, pay commission uh, rollouts over the last couple of uh, uh, decades, that you know, in the beginning, for first one or two years or three years, you tend to have a pop in consumption. So it is, it is what we feel right now. There's nothing in data to suggest right now that we can prove it, but it seems that large part of this pop is over, and it's beginning to fade. And, and since, you know, as I said, consumption is a very significant part of our economy, you know, that's kind of starting to drag the consumption. The other reason, of course, uh, that uh, is not yet talked about uh, is, is the tight monetary policy that uh, we experienced in the uh, first half of 2018. Um, interest rates were lifted. RBI talked up the rates. In fact, you know, governor and deputy governor actually talked up the term premia. And you know, this all led to 150 to 200 basis point uh, tightening in interest rates across, uh, pretty much across the curve. 
Um, this also led to higher EMIs, and, uh, and because Indian consumer is getting a bit more levered than it used to be, its impact, the monetary policy impact is going to be uh, felt a lot more on consumption uh, than you know, it used to a couple of uh, years ago. So that could be potentially one reason why Indian consumption has slowed. But actually after September, because uh, oil has come off and monetary policy orientation has actually turned a lot more dovish, but you know, whatever damage had monetary policy had to do, it had actually done. The lot of crisis that we've seen across NBFCs, the origin of this in, is more than uh, what kind of is, is, is being uh, established in ILNFS, is actually to the tight monetary policy. So much before the ILNFS happened, actually access to finance for a lot of these NBFCs that actually come down, you know, people like us and many other mutual funds and insurance companies had actually stopped lending to many of these shadow banks much ahead of ILNFS. And so maybe that's one reason because uh, you understand that uh, NBFC is a very, very significant part of a consumer finance. Um, almost about 40% of, uh, of your houses in India are actually financed by housing finance companies. And about one third of consumer durables are actually financed by uh, NBFC. So since it's a very, very large part of uh, of the uh, financing for the consumer, and if that engine slowed, it of course meant that uh, the, the, the consumption had actually begun to slow down since October, November. Uh, you know, so these are the two reasons, um, uh, the monetary policy tightness and, um, and the pay commissions uh, fading could be reason why Indian consumption is actually decelerating as we speak. But from a broad, very big picture standpoint, it is likely that uh, this, the impact of stimulus that low oil prices gave to our economy may have actually begun to fade. So just to give you a context that you know, India in 2012, 13, and 14 would import about 5.5% of our GDP from the rest of the world in terms of oil import. You know? so that's the kind of, uh, uh, on the left side that you see, that 54 to 5.6% of the GDP was effectively, um, you know, was, was the cost of oil that we were importing from the rest of the world. That actually came down substantially within two years to 2.5%. Now, in economics, of course, that means that it was a huge positive TOT or term of trade shock that India experienced. And this was a net saving to us. Um, some of it got, got to uh, government of India in terms of uh, improved fiscal situation and their impetus on infrastructure. Some of it, of course, got converted in uh, consumer surplus. So uh, there is no precise way to know again is that how much of this oil stimulus converted into into India's growth, but you know, we think, and in our assessment and analytics, we think about 50 to 60 basis point of excess growth that we experienced over the last three, three and a half years since 2015 was maybe because oil had fallen quite substantially. But of course, as we know, that in the beginning of 2018, oil actually began to creep up. And given that oil stimulus effect has already may have faded, it is likely that high oil prices now have actually begun to kind of hurt India instead of actually supporting. So that could be one big macro reason why India is experiencing a bit of a macroeconomic slowdown. Uh, uh, of course, you know, al along with uh, uh, you know, this, you know, we talked about voids last year that a key risk to uh, global growth and therefore uh, local growth is uh, what could happen and transpire between United States and China, uh, the trade skirmishes which have been going on for quite some time there. Of course, it's kind of resulted in a fairly sharp um, a drop in the, uh, the uh, trade in the world. It, on the left chart, you, know, you could see that the world trade actually has pretty much collapsed in the last uh, six, eight months. And resultantly, our, our exports, which have in any way not done very, very well for the last couple of years, have actually too come off. And export, while it's not a very substantial part of our economy, is actually, uh, since it is coming off, you know, to a certain extent, kind of it has hit our uh, growth as such. So, so that's, a, that's a big picture in terms of our growth.
Uh, now, what are policy makers doing right now? And would, is the policy in India at margin is supportive for growth or it's hurting? Um, one, of course, a big policy is, is the fiscal play. And uh, unlike you know, what is being told to all of us by the government of the day, that you know, fiscal consolidation has been underway, quite the opposite for the last good four, four and a half years, there's been a fair bit of a fiscal, um, uh, I wouldn't say profligacy, but you know, fiscal has actually expanded. It's not necessarily contracted. So since Mr. Modi came in, you know, the, our fiscal deficit in aggregate basis, if you consider um, the state fiscal deficit and some of the postponements that you know, the governments tend to do in terms of their expenditure on an year-end basis to just to meet and show low fiscal deficit. And of course, most importantly, the CPSCs, the, the public sector enterprises in India, which have been actually growing fairly rapidly. If you aggregate all of it, it would appear that you know, for last one, one and a half years particularly, we've had a fair bit of a fiscal expansion, um, you know, which is underway in our economy. Um, you know, some of the borrowing, of course, you know, like Chidamram uh, began to borrow to fund the uh, oil deficit through uh, oil bonds. You know, you have these hoodcos, PFCs, RECs, and many of the public sector enterprises actually uh, borrowing from markets uh, where the, the coupon and principles are going to be serviced by the government of country. So, so basically, all it means is that, uh, you know, at this stage, at least it looks promising that, you know, our fiscal uh, has not consolidated, and it's been a wise thing not to consolidate FIS because, uh, especially when in the backdrop of uh, a uh, fairly uh, weak banking sector and uh, and very very weak capex as such over the last couple of couple of years it kind of makes sense for government to fill in and actually spend uh, in the country so one of course is that the fiscal policy is supportive for the growth and monetary policy also which i think was mistakenly lift, rates were lifted in the first half of 2018 uh, the good news is that the current establishment has actually changed the view of course assisted by uh, what's happened uh, in the world, ha what happened to the oil. And you know, we're beginning to see uh, low um, repo rates and low rates and uh, higher liquidity in the system, which is actually a good news as far as the near-term um, growth conditions are co concerned. So basically, the big news is while the general growth uh, uh, is experiencing a bit of a cyclical downturn, consumption is at the forefront of it, which is kind of is under relatively deeper downturn. We're having uh, policy impetus, you know, and most probably would mean that the downturn is not going to be deep uh, in a substantial manner. Um, so while we talked about, uh, you know, consumption is in downturn, the good news in India, and it's going to be good news for equity as such, um, given that Mahesh talked about low profit to GDP, it's a fair argument to make, actually, given the data we have of last 25, 30 years, that only when the CAPEX actually begins to gain traction, in general, um, you begin to see uh, profits coming back to the country, uh, you know, and, and the CAPEX cycles are relatively longish, and sometimes they tend to be independent of consumption cycles. So it's been fairly long since uh, our CAPEX has been in doldrum, so to say, but no more. Uh, there are early signs, and I think we talked about in the last voice also, that early signs that, you know, the CAPEX in India is actually beginning to gain, beginning to gain traction. Uh, one such indicator, of course, uh, is that our capacities, um, we, 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 we built huge capacities during 2003 to 12, and since then we've been stuck with very, very high capacities and low utilizations. Actually, that's beginning to gain, gain traction, and many, many sectors, you know, across uh, that you see, since the capacities have actually risen quite substantially, it is very likely that you know, newer capacities <clears throat> would get kind of added over the next couple of years. And there is uh, this data that, you know, which I kind of am um, quite fond of uh, and track it that you know, what RBI does, it's a real data, uh, which kind of uh, captures the data of you know, all the project finance you know, sanctioned by banks and they kind of aggregate it and juxtaposed with you know, what has been underway, even that's kind of, so basically that's kind of hinting that you know, you're beginning to see some bit of uh, uh, traction in you know, even banks you know, financing newer set of projects. So the big picture of course is that you know, my sense is that after a 
you know, fairly long hit us in terms of uh, CAPEX expansion, we're beginning to see uh, a reasonable traction in the, uh, in, in the CAPEX. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's going to be a very slow process. Uh, unlike in the past, you know, um, this time around, our banks are, as Mahesh mentioned, while the NPAs are actually coming off, the, 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 the stress in the banking is still fairly high. And uh, I think our monetary policies have tightened significantly more than, you know, what they did in the past, and which is precisely why the CAPEX recovery in India is going to be a lot slower than, you know, what otherwise, you know, would, you would have imagined in a country like ours, which is somewhat capital and, and capacity starved, so to say. Um, the another thing in, in, in uh, CAPEX, you know, which is not much talked about because, you know, most of us worry about, you know, what big corporates are doing in, in terms of CAPEX, uh, the, the real downturn that you saw in, in CAPEX was actually in the household balance sheets. You know, by the way, a typical household actually contribute a lot more to the CAPEX in this country than a corporate. And that is where, surprisingly, and almost it remained unnoticed for a couple of years, uh, at least from a government standpoint and policymakers, actually not yet you know, much of discussion and discourse is happening in and around it, is that uh, the capacity uh, creation, and for a household, the capacity creation is about you know, building dwellings, houses, and so on and so forth. You know, that's kind of been on a secular downturn for a good five, six years. So almost a 6% reduction in, in the capex in the household balance sheet. So basically, a lot of you and people of our country are not building houses as, as, at, at the speed at, at which you know, they would build until about a few years ago. And that may be one of the bigger reasons uh, and the origin of the general CAPEX slowdown in our country. So, uh, so basically, um, what's the news out there? It is possible, as Mahesh mentioned, that uh, the, the general affordability in, uh, for the household has actually risen quite substantially. Uh, and almost about 30 to 50 percent, your salaries and incomes have risen in last three, four, five years. Whereas, you know, houses, house prices, pretty much across big cities and small cities in India, have a kind of stayed fairly uh, uh, stagnant, and which is why they've gotten much more uh, cheaper, so to say. Uh, and it's possible that now there would be a bit of a turnaround in in household capex as well. Another thing, uh, which is uh, my hypothesis, is which is not much talked about again, is this in the household, you know, the what Guru Murthy mentioned that about uh, six, seven crore uh, proprietary firms are also categorized as household in India. And for a variety of reasons over the last six, seven years, a lot of these firms have not been investing, have not been making money, and GST, demonetization, and so on and so forth actually squeezed them a lot. I think after long, because of GST rationalization, the fact that the cash is back in the economy, it is possible that a lot of these small, small prop firms would begin to invest again. And therefore, you know, I'm fairly optimistic that over the next five, seven years, you would see a, a fairly a strong CAPEX recovery in India. So, so that's about growth. Net-net in near term, consumer slowing down and uh, CAPEX beginning to recover. So which essentially means that unless there is the deep, the, the, the downturn in the, in the world is not very deep, it's very likely that India would actually uh, do fairly well. Now let's quickly move to the next big uh, macro variable, which is inflation. It's, of course, you know, we've been talking about it for the last few years. India's inflation has actually come off quite substantially. It is very important to understand the context of India's inflation. For a good 40 years from mid-70s until 2013-14, we've act actually averaged at about 8% in terms of inflation. And since then, it's just 4.5%. Now, this is very, very important uh, for a lot of you and us in terms of pricing assets, because understand that you know, in the end, all assets are going to be priced to inflation, be it fixed income, equity, or real estate. And if inflation has come off by about 3 to 4% in India, accordingly, you know, most assets, too, would have to kind of be repriced. And the nominal growth of economy, nominal growth of earnings, and everything would have to get repriced. One of the reasons maybe why um, the, the, the recovery in earnings uh, that Mahesh talked about is not coming forth is because you know, whenever a country experiences a sudden shift in inflation on the lower side, 
You know, you have the drag on earnings for a couple of years, but my sense is that, um, you know, it, I, I think a lot of uh, countries' policies and uh, e economic policies particularly would adjust to the new level of inflation. Uh, of course, the large part of India's disinflation has been on account of food, and uh, the good news, of course, is that uh, uh, the lot of food disinflation is not, a, not necessarily to do with demand destruction, you know, which some of us hypothesized during demonetization. I think some of it is to do with, the, or rather large part of it is to do with the fact that India's supply response on the food side finally, over the last decade, has been extremely promising. You know, many, many food articles that we all consume, be it pulses, egg, milk, horticulture, uh, fruits, everything has kind of grown at about two to four times or five times of population growth, essentially leading to a possibility of a production glut, and that's potentially one big reason why India's food inflation has undershot quite remarkably and in, in some form, you know, unprecedented of sorts in our country. Uh, also, you know, policies like MSPs that we've talked about many times, because we have an inflation targeting uh, framework in place, almost all policies of the government, RBI and many other uh, such institutions are going to uh, ensure that uh, no big macro moves are taken to uh, kind of disturb the general prognosis on inflation that we all want, which is low inflation, so to say. Um, but now, you know, there's just two quick points here, that uh, while food inflation has come off quite substantially, it has led to a situation where the term of trade adjustment against the agrarian economy and in favor of urban India or you could call it in, in consumer India has happened way too far. And my sense is that over the next couple of months and quarters, you would see uh, food beginning to creep up uh, more towards uh, where the core is right now. And because what we talked about, the cyclical slowdown in our country, would actually ensure that most probably the core inflation kind of begin to come off. So at some point in time, over six to nine months out, you know, we would kind of, both core and food inflation would meet each other at about four and a half percent. So that's our assessment of, uh, um, you know, inflation. So the drivers of inflation, of course, at margin are going to change. Most probably you will have a non-food inflation coming off and food beginning to creep up. Uh, also on the left side, you know, you, you already see that the divergence between food inflation in rural and urban India, uh, you know, which is quite substantial, and urban food inflation has already started to kind of spike up. It's very likely that, you know, rural economies, food inflation too, you would begin to creep up, you know, fairly soon. Uh, so while, you know, we've kind of celebrated India's food inflation uh, as if it's somewhat idiosyncratic, but in reality, uh, pretty much across the globe, uh, inflation has been missing, and to the surprise of most inflation hawks and people who kind of believe that this massive quantitative easing, LTROs, low interest rates, you know, would eventually result in hyperinflation. But in, in reality, what of course played out was over the last 10 years of these extraordinarily uh, low rates and, uh, and hyperactive central banks did not mean anything to the wages. Uh, did not mean anything to, uh, you know, lift interest rates in any significant manner. Um, you know, if, just to give you a broad perspective, that uh, that over the last 10, 12 years, you know, the global inflation has been about had been about at around two and a half percent, and uh, and uh, the G7, the top seven eight countries, um, inflation has been about 2.3, 2.4 percent, and both have actually kind of come off quite significantly over the last six eight months, you know, the G7 is now tracking 1.4%, um, you know, substantially lower than what their policymakers uh, are targeting. Now, why has, you know, global inflation has been on decline? Uh, why all this excess money that, you know, central bankers have created has not led to higher wages? Uh, there are many theories about it, you know, some of them uh, linked to, uh, you know, technological improvements, you know, productivity gains because of the same. Uh, some, of course, talk of, you know, effects like Amazon effect, you know, which is a great marketplace to get all sorts of sellers and, you know, that depresses the prices of, uh, um, you know, various sellers. But my sense is that, uh, you know, most probably it's the, is, is the impact of uh, non-unionization of labor. 
given that larger and larger percentage of labor is non-unionized in the world today, and of course, with the great supply chains established, you know, globalization that Guru Murthy talked about, you know, 25 years, and I think it's not dead. Um, my sense is that uh, um, that's been the one important reason why inflation in the world has been somewhat missing. Now, it's always, it, it always important to note that inflation has been one thing, you know, which has kind of surprised, um, you know, everyone. Uh, every few decades, you know, people get complacent about it. So let's not get complacent about it, but it's precise to say that at least in near term, I think the, the, the fear of inflation has been grossly exaggerated you know, by many, many traditional economists and orthodoxies. You know? And it's likely that inflation would kind of stay tame for the next couple of uh, quarters at least. Um, of course, you know, now we know that uh, because of the cyclical downturn in the world and, of course, low inflation, the monetary policy uh, across the world have eased. Uh, Fed, uh, you know, has turned dovish, and uh, ECB is now talking of LTRO3. So, you know, whole world, you know, the, the central bankers have actually, who were excessively, uh, I would argue, hawkish until about eight, nine months ago, have turned extremely dovish again. Uh, the, the Fed rate, you know, which was, which was expected to rise to 3% by end of uh, 2020 now, you know, at least we believe that, you know, you'll have 50 to 75 basis point rate cut coming in uh, United States next year. So basically, uh, across uh, central bankers of the big world, the developed world, and emerging markets, you know, you've seen a softening of bias. Uh, and of course, RBI too uh, quickly followed. You know, I think it was a mistake to tighten rates uh, and talk up the rates and talk up the term premium. I did a fair bit of damage to our economy in the first half of 2018, and it was premature. Uh, but uh, the good news is, of course, that RBI has uh, eased uh, liquidity. There's been a gush of liquidity coming in through OMOs. And, uh, of course, you've seen uh, since Mr. Das has come in, you know, very practically, uh, you know, his kind of ease rates uh, to kind of uh, accommodate the, all the concerns that you have uh, for the macro. But uh, interestingly, since Das has been appointed as governor, we've seen a bit of a divergence, you know, in the first... From September to December, you know, you, you had uh, long end and short end actually both kind of going down. Uh, but since uh, Mr. Das has come in and cut rates, you've seen a divergence coming in when uh, short end actually has uh, come down a lot, aligning with the repo rates, but uh, long end rates have actually not come off at all. Now, people uh, often think that it could be because of uh, Maybe it's policy mistake because remember I showed you that the core inflation in India has actually bottomed about two years ago and is not coming off. So many in India actually think that it could be because of uh, uh, because of that. You know, pe markets are anticipating this to be a bit of a policy mistake, and which is why the long end rates are not coming off. Um, of course, you know, systemic liquidity in India has kind of stayed very very tight. And despite 3 lakh crore of OMOs last year, um, even today, the banking system you know, continues to struggle with about a lakh crore of uh, deficient liquidity. And that could be one of the reasons why you know, low rates have not gotten transmitted into longer end of the curve. Um, of course, you know, one reason why you know, long end in India and also now in emerging markets are not coming off is because surprisingly, with very, very dovish Fed, you're still not experiencing what you call it, soft dollar or a weak dollar. So which essentially means that many people are, could be worried that, uh, that you know, this risk off may not necessarily be good for all sorts of good risk, you know, and which is why the sovereign long end across the emerging markets may not be rallying. Uh, but I think the true reason and the most important reason, uh, I think uh, Mahesh talked about it, Ajay had a mention of it, is why you know, long end rates are not coming up is there's a sheer crowding out which is playing out in India that the government as a percentage of uh, total borrowing uh, in, 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 in the system is becoming bigger and bigger. About 10, 12 years ago, government's gross borrowing used to be 20 to 40 percent of the total aggregate deposit of the banking. You know, every year you would grow something and only 20 to 40 percent, you know, 
would be the gross borrowing. That number has risen to 100%. So basically, one of the reasons why long and in India is refusing to rally significantly is because you have had uh, massive crowding out by the government of the country, as well as, of course, uh, state governments. Uh, uh, quickly on, the, uh, on our views on interest rates and you know, why it's actually a great uh, time for the fixed income investors, despite a lot of noise about credit and many such things, and of course lower and higher interest rates. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it's the first time an Indian investor is experiencing a substantial real rate um, in, 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 in the past 40, 50 years. You know? Just think of it that in, until about, let's say, 2014, the previous five years, the repo rate was about minus two, minus three percent in terms of real rate. Now it's actually two to two and a half percent real rate. So, so even repo rate has actually become quite constructive uh, in terms of the real rate. It's kind of risen a lot. The same thing has, of course, played out to one-year fixed deposits. You know, for a good 40 years, India's uh, fixed deposits, you know, gave about zero real returns. Now they actually give about two percent or real returns. So. So even the fixed deposit, you know, which is otherwise seen as a very passive and low yielding instrument, is actually giving you positive returns. Uh, but more so, uh, you know, so what fund industry, you know, kind of uh, relates to is, you know, the corporate market bond yield, you know, be it AAA or AA, the spreads versus fixed deposits out there have risen quite substantially. So versus, uh, let's say, fixed deposit, you know, the AAA corporate bond of two year or three year would typically yield about, um, about 40, 50 basis point. Now they're about 100 to 125 basis point. So in a sense, you know, if you are in, in fixed income fund, it's very likely that your outcome is likely to be much, much better than what it's been in the past. You know, you could see it in a passive fund like liquid fund over the last three years have re returned about 2.5% real. And in, in, in reality, you know, what it, this, this is what matters to you as investors, that are you able to beat inflation through uh, fixed income instruments. Um, uh, the third and the most important part for a lot of investors in fixed income is the IBC resolution. I think much has been talked about it uh, since morning. Uh, it's only two points I would like to make here. One is that because of IBC, of course, the uh, recovery rate in India has improved dramatically as a lender or fund managers when we lend to people. And if it, let's say, company uh, folds, it's li now likely that you will recover about 45 to 50% of your dues. So the loss given defaults have fallen remarkably. And versus, you know, it used to be 10, 15, 20% in the run up to IBC. And more importantly, of course, the resolution time now has fallen to about one year. In 80s and 90s, it would be 8, 10, 15 years. So there's been a substantial improvement because of IBC, and which is again uh, is going to aid the general experience of uh, all investors uh, in the fixed income. Uh, now, you know, very quickly on the long-term growth, I think much has been talked about it uh, in India. Just a few points. One, that India and China, um, what Gurumurthy talked about, that, you know, uh, until, until, you know, 1300 and 1400, you know, we kind of together were two-thirds of the world economy. Of course, it fell to less than 10% and is on rise again and most probably would be one-third of world economy in the next 15, 20 years ago, next 20, 15, 20 years. But in this, India's rise actually uh, is happening in the backdrop of a sharply slowing China for reasons that we all know. One, of course, is the population growth. And second, of course, is, is, is that China has overbuilt itself, and it's very unlikely by building roads to nowhere, bridges to nowhere, you know, you would begin to see, uh, you, you would most probably see China at margin slowing down. So, so basically, uh, uh, it, it, in this context and backdrop, India would most probably not only become a five trillion dollar economy, but you know for all the all the you know reforms which have been undertaken that Mahesh uh, Bala and uh, and uh, Ajay talked about, it's very likely that uh, if we will not only muddle through but maybe accelerate from here and get to about eight nine trillion dollar economy in 2030. Thank you.